um, American minorities. So President Barack Obama said in his final State of the Union address, we need to reject any politics that targets people because of race or religion. This isn't a matter of political correctness, it's an understanding of what makes us strong. Now race, religion, and reproduction. These three R's are some, if not the most controversial topics that exist within contemporary American culture. And the way that these ideals are perceived is greatly influenced by what political party is in control of the government at that specific time. So with the tensions increased between the Republican and the Democratic Party after the announcement of Donald Trump's presidential campaign, and after his actual presidential election, Many minority groups feel as though they are underrepresented and unfairly treated within society today. And while there are many minority groups within the society today, I'm majorly going to be focusing on the two next, uh, Jewish and Muslim Americans. Now, this isn't the first time within the nation that minorities feel as though they have been unfairly treated. During the American Revolution, British Tory loyalists were the victims of economic, financial, and physical abuse. And this abuse majorly stemmed from the conflicting ideologies with the American patriots, who were the majority of the colonial population. Now, they were persecuted and they were unfairly treated, which ended up and them leaving in a diaspora, which is a forced migration due to these feelings of civil unrest. Now, after the 2016 election, much like the British loyalists, Muslim Americans, Latinx Americans, and Jewish Americans feel as though they are unfairly treated and persecuted within society today. And so my research thesis for this project is there are many parallels between the minority groups of the American Revolution and in contemporary American society after the 2016 presidential election. Now these parallels include the size of the populations afflicted, legal and physical abuse, the occurrence of diasporic migrations, and the language which is used against minorities by the leaders of the United States. Now understanding the experiences of the loyalists can help us to then understand the experiences of which minorities are facing within contemporary America. So the first parallel I'm going to be presenting is the population statistics. So for the current US population, Muslim Americans make up 1%, Jewish Americans make up 3%, and Latinx Americans make up 18%, totaling 22% of the current United States population. Now during the American Revolution, British Tory loyalists made up 20 25% of this population. Now paralleling these two, they create about 20% of their total population, which is around one-fifth of the population, allowing for them to be titled the forgotten fifth. Now the second parallel we're going to be discussing is the forms of abuse which these minorities were faced. And the first form of abuse is going to be legal abuse. And for the British loyalists, this was mainly in the form of anti-loyalist legislation. So now in general, each colonial government passed around six different types of anti-loyalist legislation. And these were limiting political speech, making it illegal to adhere to Great Britain, banishing or quarantining loyalists, taxing or confiscating loyalist land, removing loyalists from public office, and the test acts. Now, the test acts required an oath of allegiance to the colonies be signed or spoken, and whoever did not adhere to the test acts, they were thought to be loyalists, and then they were punished in different ways. Majority, they were punished by having their lands taxed, or they had their weapons seized. Now moving on to contemporary legislation, in September of 2017, the Trump administration announced its plan for phasing out the Deferred uh, Action for Childhood Arrival Program, or DACA. While it is still unknown exactly what's going to happen to DACA and its dreamers, uh, former President Barack Obama stated that it is self-defeating and that it is cruel to um, plan to phase out this DACA movement. And moving on to uh, Muslims, on January 27, 2017, Executive Order 13769, also known as the Muslim Travel Ban, was announced by the Trump's administration. Now, although on February 15, 2018, the uh, Fourth Circuit U.S. Court in Richmond, Virginia, announced in a 9-4 vote that by looking at Trump's statements, the plan itself, and his administration politics, that this ban was unconstitutionally tainted with anemis towards Islam. And now, while there hasn't been anything regarding Jews in legislation, um, there has been a seen rise in anti-Semitism after President Trump's election, which I will discuss later on. So overall, there is a parallel in legislation which has been created directly towards these minority groups. Now, my second um, form of abuse that I'm going to be talking about is physical abuse. And most notably for the British loyalists of the American Revolution, this was through the act of tar and feather. Now, tar and feathering was when hot tar would be applied on the victim's body and then feathers would then be applied after. So these victims would then be paraded around town in a ceremonial exhibition of humiliation. 
And while there are many reports and accounts of, of British loyalists to one another, the most notable account I found happened in the spring of 1776 when a young mother named her newborn son Thomas Gage after the former British military commander. Patriot women of Stratford, Connecticut then learned about this and they marched in the greatest good order and presented Thomas Gage's mother with a suit of tarn feathers. Now another form of abuse was known as riding the rail and this was a very male specific form of abuse in which men were fashioned in between their holes and they were carried on the shoulders of two other people. Now, Dr. Joseph Clark recalls that he several times fainted from this terrible pain. And moving on to contemporary, this chart is statistics from the FBI's hate crimes, and this is an analysis of anti-Jewish, anti-Muslim, and anti-Latinx incidents from 2015 and 2016. And we can clearly see from 2015 to 2016, there has been an increase in these hate crimes which were taking place against these minority groups. Now moving into specific examples of abuse, for um, Muslim Americans, the SAALT, or South Asian Americans Leading Together, they did a study which documented xenophobic political commentary and hate violence, and they found that out of 213 hate violence instances, one in five perpetrators either invoked Donald Trump's name, his campaign slogan, or his administration's politics. And one specific example occurred in January 6, 2017, when a man was arrested for threatening to kill members of a Bellevue mosque. Victims then recalled that he was screaming, I'm going to sweep you, I'm going to assassinate every one of you, and that there is no place in America for Muslims. Moving on to examples of Jewish abuse, during 2016, 1,538 religious offenses took place, in which 54.2% of those were anti-Jewish. And in a study done from January 1st to March 23rd, 2017, 146 bomb threats were made to 105 Jewish-oriented locations, such as schools and primary um, uh, community centers. Now, another specific example was the Unite the Right rally, which took place on August 12th through 11th, 2017, in which these protesters commonly shouted anti-Semitic slurs such as, Heil Trump, White Lives Matter, You Will Not Replace Us, and Jews Will Not Replace Us. Now, another an example of Latinx American abuse. On January 8, 2017, Megan Martinez Cruz, who was a DACA dreamer, he was struck in the head with a knife on his way home on the subway coming home from his uh, restaurant ship in Lower Manhattan. Uh, the attacker was screaming, we will kill all of them and remove them from our country. Cruz recalls, I could not move, I was in shock, I thought this man was going to kill me. And the next form of abuse, uh, sorry, the next parallel I'm going to be presenting to you, my third parallel, is the unsavory commentary which was made from leaders of the uh, United States or this nation against these minority groups. So George Washington in the letter written to his brother stated, one or two loyalists have done what a great many ought to have done a long time ago, committed suicide. By all acts, there never existed a more miserable set of beings than these wretched creatures that are now taught to believe that the power of Great Britain was superior to all opposition. Paralleling to Donald Trump today, Trump has been re um, reported uh, when he's speaking about um, Latinos and Mexican Americans that they are not our friends. Believe me, they bring drugs, they bring crime, they are rapists. And Trump was also uh, documented calling Afghanistan a terrorist haven. Now, oops, sorry. Now, when you think about the British loyalists, they were subject to this uh, legislative and physical abuse. What ended up happening? They ended up in a diaspora due to these um, persecutory actions which were taken out amongst them. Now, while diaspora might be a confusing term, I added a few pictures of the Jewish diaspora, which was when it was a forced population migration out of one's homeland, and they had to move into different places. You can also see this with the Africa diaspora, or which is commonly known as the slave trade, which is when they were forced and they were moved to different places. So, um, when referring to the British loyalists, about 60,000 to 75,000 British loyalists fled the colonies during the after the war. And mainly these loyalists fled to countries under Great Britain's rule. Now, when we're talking about today, however, there is no documented report of a minority diaspora happening after the 2016 election. However, anecdotally, there does seem to be an influx of minorities moving to such sanctuary states and other places where deportation laws are a little bit more relaxed and where the states are more liberal. So, for example, in October of 2017, California Governor Jerry Brown, who signed the sanctuary state bill, while it is still unsure exactly what's going to happen with this bill and how it is going to be played out into the future, um, Governor Brown recalls that these are uncertain times for undocumented Californians and their families. 
and this bill strikes the balance that will protect public safety while bringing measure of comfort to those families who are now living in fear every day. So hypothetically, this bill and many others for other sanctuary states could increase an influx of minorities coming from more conservative states, moving from more harsher deportation laws, and to states which are now more liberal and which have more sanctuary and less harsh deportation laws. So in conclusion, the loyalists were the victims of legal and physical abuse as well as many great deals of harassment. So now minorities of contemporary America in society, they also are victims of this legal and physical abuse and they often feel victimized and persecuted. Now while we know that the loyalists ended up in a diaspora, an option for diaspora within contemporary American culture might be available today and it might become more relevant with these notice of sanctuary states and um, with an influx of minorities in our population today. Now while my message today isn't to tell you that we need to do something right away, but George Santana once said, those who, do not, those who do not remember history are condemned to repeat it. We must be aware of our actions and we must be aware of what's happening within our society to better protect and help the minorities of American society today. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Okay, we'll now go forward with three minutes of Q&A. presentation, thank you for it. Um, I had a student of mine do something similar last year, and a lot of her focus was on what happened to the loyalists after the war. Did your uh, research take you in that direction? My original presentation, yes, it did take me there. I talked about um, moving into Upper Canada and Nova Scotia and looking at the benefits of compared to um, what some of the loyalists when they stayed in the colonies, kind of parallel between those. So yes, this was my second part of this presentation. My first presentation just focused mainly on the uh, British loyalists, but when I was doing the research, I started to notice some parallels for between today, so that I made this one. But yes, I did actually focus on what happened to them after within the diaspora. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move forward with our second presenter.